joining us for today's seminar. Um, this seminar is titled The 2022 Climate Impact and Australian Climate Policy, um, hosted by Melbourne Climate Futures and also the School of Social and Political Sciences. My name is Theo and I'm a PhD student in Melbourne Climate Futures and Asia Institute here at UniMel. Um, and I'll be moderating the seminar today presented by Will and James. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the seminar is taking place, which is the Wurundjeri people, um, and pay respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to any First Nations people with us in the room and those joining online from other traditional lands around Australia. Uh, today's seminar is hosted by Melbourne Climate Futures here at the University of Melbourne, which brings together research and expertise from across the university to learn, educate and guide discussions around climate change. Uh, just a quick note that today's seminar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the University of Melbourne's YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be running a Q&A after the presentation where we'll take questions from both the online and the in-person audience. For those online, please use the Zoom Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen to leave questions for the presenters. Now, we're delighted today to wel welcome both James from the University of Manchester and Will from here at the University of Melbourne. James is an ESRC postdoctoral fellow at SCI, researching the politics of the electric vehicle transition and the intersection of fiscal, monetary, and climate policy. He's also the author of an upcoming book, quote, Driving Climate Breakdown, How Our Cars, Cars Fuel, Climate Politics, and the Electric Vehicle Transition with Cambridge University Press, and another book entitled The Environmental Cost of the Beautiful Game, the unsustainability of football, which we would call soccer here in Australia. <laughs> uh, that one's with Manchester University Press. Uh, William is a PhD candidate at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. His PhD focuses on domestic political processes and the enabling and constraining conditions that shape climate ambition and its change over time. He holds a Master of Geography from the University of Melbourne and a Master of International Politics from KU Lupin. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to James and Will to kick off today's seminar. Perfect. Thank you, Theo. And thank you, everyone online and in the room. Welcome to our presentation, Emergent Leader, Assistant Lagarde, Australian Climate Politics after the 2022 Climate Change Act. And brief overview of what we're doing today. So first, we're going to provide a context of the project itself, um, which has been an ongoing participation and collaboration with the University of Manchester and the University of Toronto. They're going to talk about the Australian case specifically, give a brief overview of like leadership and, of course, laggardship, which is what we're primarily interested in. Brief overview of the methodology, the lost decade in Australian climate policy, which is the 2013 to 2022 coalition era. Um, and going to look at the domestic processes under that with the three I framework, interests, ideas and institutions, and then talk about what has changed since the 2022 Climate Change Act. Yeah, thanks very much, Will. So before we get to the nitty gritty of uh, Australian climate politics, as Will mentioned, it's important uh, to probably mention that this, the sort of genesis of this paper is the product of a broader um, collaborative project between the University of Manchester, which is part of myself, Matt Patterson, Paul Tobin, from the University of Melbourne, so Rob and Kate, Justin, uh, Alger and, and others, and people at Toronto, so Stefan Rankins, um, Stephen, uh, Stephen Bernstein, uh, Kate Neville and others which was looking at the impact of COVID-19 and inflation on net zero objectives. And by virtue of the three uh, institutions being part of it, those three countries are what we're looking at, plus Germany. And for a time, we did also have Japan and India, but they've, also, they've since been um, removed for data purpose reasons. And the project was essentially trying to, was jumping off from the premise that economic crises incur a negative impact on climate policies more broadly, which is something environmental scholars have observed for some time. Yeah. This emerges differently in different contexts. For example, in the in the global south, this is sort of a bit of prevailing view that when um, global south countries have to undertake sort of structural adjustments, whether it be because there has been a, an economic contraction, there is a currency depreciation. At those moments, climate policies and to a certain extent social. Uh, policies are seen as an unnecessary burden and essentially reflate the economy, address currency appreciations to get exports going again. Environmental policies, at least in the short term, need to be scrapped or at least retrenched upon. So in terms of the sort of medium and longer term, we, we can perhaps address them, although a sort of critical scholar like myself would question whether that, that actually happens. But then in the global north, uh, it was also observed a similar relationship. So 
some work done by my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, Charles Burns, basically observed after the global financial crisis, the, a lot of states went against, against the sort of prevailing view that when economic traction, uh, contractions occur, states probably should undertake sort of a post-Keynesian counter-cycle fiscal expansion to get the economy going. But actually, when we undertook a bit of uh, contraction, i.e. austerity, environmental policies bore quite, uh, bore quite a lot of the brunt of that because it, it, it's contingent upon some sort of state capacity to design, implement, administer, monitor a lot of environmental policies. Basically observed in the UK and the EU more broadly, after the financial crisis, a lot of climate policies actually reduced after uh, after austerity. So what we observed within the project, and uh, sort of tying into a sort of wider observation of what happened during COVID with regards to uh, climate policy, is actually a fiscal expansion that happened, which if you just read some of the World Bank and IMF documents, was actually a response to the, the, the sort of backwards thinking that they did during the global financial crisis, actually the fiscal expansion that happened, which I suppose we could probably all agree was necessary, inevitably flows to carbon intensive incumbents, whether it be to provide them some form of uh, tax rebate, tax write off to, to furlough their workers rather than take a structural adjustment of the economy. And the sort of central bank reserves that we observed after the financial crisis, and again during COVID, almost inevitably flow to high carbon intensive industries. And that's just, that's just not in terms of quantitative easing, but many sort of privileged facilities at central banks, including the, uh, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, all did things like this, where they made privileged facilities just for high carbon intensive industries. And then during inflation, again, what we saw was, given that inflation was primarily caused, and what is often associated with recent inflation, was caused by a supply side shock of actually carbon intensive energy. And it wasn't just caused by, um, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was also caused by a sort of mismatch of supply and demand due to the uneven reopenings after COVID-19 and supply bottlenecks out of, uh, from China. Actually, what we saw was rather than states actually acknowledge, particularly in things like the UK and Germany, that actually we received a supply side shock of oil and natural gas, perhaps we should move away from those um, forms of energy. Actually, what a lot of states did was just sort of move to different forms of fossil fuel energy. So in the UK, we briefly um, we briefly entertained the prospect of fracking. We're now also going to do for, uh, further oil and gas exploration. Germany have done the same. Germany have actually invested quite a lot in LNG infrastructure, and they've gone to literal to flatten literal towns in Germany. So it's quite a prominent case in Germany where they've flattened a town called Lutzerath in the southwest of Germany to increase co uh, coal reserves within Germany rather than undertake a, a sort of um, low carbon transition, which I think a lot of environmental scholars would have hoped they would have done it during this time. Germany's also delayed a lot of um, coal uh, phase out of coal and nuclear. Some, some environmental uh, climate objectives have been scrapped. So I don't know if anyone keeps track of um, uh, Scottish politics, for example. Well, basically, the Scottish government found only a month ago that they're probably not going to meet the 2030 climate objective, so they just scrapped it. And have since then, got uh, it's led to a leadership election, and that uh, the first minister of Scotland has since been replaced. But the climate objectives have not been replaced or reinstated since. We've also seen a, a rise in uh, right-wing populism, so for particularly in the UK. Um, Rishi Sunak is essentially now arguing that net zero was never actually voted for. It's been a completely depoliticized area of British politics. And actually what we need to do is repoliticize climate politics. And after the, the shocks, that actually the uh, net zero is a, is a sort of burden. We shouldn't be really focused on climate change objectives. We'd actually be trying to just shift away from that, and just get the economy going. And there was a popular speech that he did in which he said he was getting rid of seven climate policies, which included things like a meat tax, an aviation tax, a seven bin scheme and things like that. Only Basically, what everyone observed was none of these policies actually existed. So they never existed in the first place, but nonetheless, it serves to show how climate, our right and populism is now pushing back against climate politics rather than a sort of broader embrace um, across the political spectrum. And also, finally, what we saw was this sort of increase in interest rates. So when inflation hits sort of orthodox monetary policy would dictate you raise interest rates to stifle demand, and that will therefore bring down um, inflation. Obviously, because it was a supply, it was a shock of supply rather than excess of demand. What we, what we ultimately saw was actually increased interest rate, interest rates disproportionately impact green firms. They're far smaller in scale. They have 
very little access to capital markets to actually finance some of these operations. When you increase interest rates, they almost are driven to default, whereas actually larger companies, i.e. the fossil fuel industry, can actually survive these a lot, a lot easier. So interest rates have actually, in some ways, removed some of the very industries we actually need to move away from further supply-side shocks like this in the future. So in terms of the project we're currently doing, this is a, an article we, we're currently writing as part of the broader group. And in terms of the good news, so the last slide was probably the bad news, this is a bit better news, is what we've seen is climate policy has almost become now indistinguishable with industrial policy. And in the, in the article we're writing, we're terming this as this process of disentangling. So countries to move away from these shocks in the future are trying to disentangle themselves from vulnerable and precarious supply chains which has been coupled with this sort of broader change about this idea of onshoring and reshoring and friendshoring and this return of industrial policy, particularly amongst Western economies. This idea of state capitalism, if you read the work of um, Ilya Salami, and this idea that perceived liberal states are now going to adopt illiberal means to achieve climate policy and by extension industrial policy. And we can see this across all the four cases we're looking at. So as you can see on the slides, Australia's introduced the Powering Australia Plan, the Climate Change Act we're going to talk about today. Amongst a broader shift of this desire to be a clean energy superpower, Canada's introduced the 2030 Emissions Reductions Plan, and its 20, 20, uh, 2023 budget has actually tried to mirror a lot of stuff with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is probably one of the prime examples of disentangling. Germany's introduced the Easter package, in which it's trying to overhaul its, its domestic energy market to remove itself from Russia as part of the European Green Deal, which is going to invest 1 trillion euros, apparently, in um, green technology. And it's also just implemented the Net Zero Industry Act to bring a lot more manufacturing to Europe. The UK has also introduced the Green Industrial Revolution, the Net Zero Industry Act. We also introduced, the, there's, a bit, there's a seeming focus, at least in the UK, on the idea of levelling up, which follows on from the industrial strategy in 2017. And... Um, Opposite to what environmental scholars would assume there has been a negative impact, as I mentioned at the start, what actually we think we're seeing at the moment is there has been no broad retrenchment of climate ambition. Actually, there's probably been a maintenance of climate ambition in some cases, an actual increased ambition in what we're calling policy, uh, an increased policy intensity across the four cases. No, not a lot. And the opposite of policy intensity for the paper we've actually got revisions on as part of a, a team is actually this idea of policy density, which, if nothing else, is just a case of counting the policies that have been implemented during this time. So as you can see, across all six cases, and obviously we're going to remove India or Japan, you can see it's a broad correlation of all countries essentially sticking to a broader increased policy density of climate policy. There is no broad retrenchment what we, what we found in any of the cases. Why this is particularly significant is, for example, Germany and the UK, as we're going to speak about in a minute, are perceived climate leaders, and they've long been perceived climate leaders. Canada and Australia, particularly Australia for the purposes of today's talk, have long been considered what's called a climate laggard. So again, so why should you care moment, for the, uh, particularly for the art, mm -hmm. is Australia has long been considered a climate leader. If, if there's any one country that seems to personify this idea it is often Australia. They're the first country to introduce an emissions trading scheme and then scrap it, at least amongst developed economies. And the sort of broad correlation we found sort of beg the question is, is something different now happening in Australia? And this seems to tie in quite nicely with the election of the Labour government in 2022 and the enactment of the Climate Change Act, which set legally binding targets and emission reductions. And I suppose what particularly interests me about Australia, so it obviously doesn't live here, as you can tell from the accent, is Australia has a lot of fossil fuel reserves, which is obviously going to be particularly problematic, and we'll lay that out later in, in the talk. But they also have a lot of the critical minerals for, low, for the sustainable futures we need to move towards. So Australia did a critical minerals report in which it said, we have 27 of the critical minerals that there's now a huge race for. They're actually a world leader in 15 of them, and they're just they are the front-running world leader in things like lithium iron. So this is going to condition what us political economists would call the transition risks of uh, Australia's shift to, to net zero, in which they've said it's got to balance the sort of fossil fuel past with a sort of critical minerals future, which puts them in quite a unique position. So in terms of climate leadership, there's a sort of propensity amongst environmental scholars to try and just determine who are the leaders and who are the laggards of this, which is 
essentially an asset strategy. I mean, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? You know, who are the real bastards of the whole thing? And who do we need to avoid? And who do we need to replicate? Uh, and this is often based on some sort of a legislative target. So in the UK, we have the Climate Change Act, some form of historical success or some actions in the climate change negotiations. And the, the sort of subject of analysis of part of this literature is, is pluralised now, a bit far beyond states. There's also cities that are now subject of analysis. And me and Paul Toby at Manchester are looking at a few cities, of which Melbourne is one of them, which is tied into the sort of broader idea of uh, multi-level and polycentric climate governance, which is the interaction of different layers of governments in different political settings with non-state actors as well. And this has also gone to industries and sectors. So Stefan Bach, for example, has even questioned whether the oil and gas sector could be considered a climate leader. Central banks have been considered if they were a climate leader. And I went to a talk recently in Manchester in which they were trying to think about environmental philanthropists as environmental leaders, people like Jeff Bezos. But what the leadership aspect is contingent upon, written on by Yveria and Robin Eckersley, is contingent upon this principle that a normative principle at least that people do want to be a leader but in that whether it be a state or an actor the very the very fact that climate change is make, is going to make sure everything we love and cherish perish or disappear before our eyes is rational enough for us to do something about this whereas for anyone that's obviously studied climate change for any period of time would know that is empirically not true that does not motivate enough people so for i don't know for example i don't know if anyone keeps up shot with um British politics, but Laura McFadden, who, uh, McDonald rather, who is a, a climate change activist, spoke at the recent Rosefield exploration done by the Norwegian government. She, and she said to them directly, You're making re you've made record profits, you know what climate change does, you know what it's already doing, and it's still not enough for you guys to ch for change course. So this idea that this normative principle will sort of evoke climate change action, action rather, we know that's not true. But beyond the sort of normative principle, we could, there's also a sort of informal legal framework, trying within the common but differentiated responsibilities from the Rio Earth Summit, in which my friend Paul Tobin's written about, that does place expectations on developing economies to play a greater responsibility in this. So in terms of who the climate leaders are, I'll try and breeze over this, because uh, if we want to talk about these countries a bit more in depth afterwards, we can. But I've worked on these three countries who are often considered climate leaders, hence why I did the research on them. But this is it's sufficient to say why climate leaders isn't always straightforward. So Norway, for example, is often seen as the climate leader. It set the first one of the first carbon taxes in 1991. It's got the highest percentage of electric vehicles per capita. And I've been to Norway and there is a lot of them. There's also 96 percent hydropower. But to finance a lot of this, the, Nor the Norwegian government is contingent upon a sovereign wealth fund, 40% which of its income comes from oil. And actually, if you factored in scope three emissions to Norway, one of the statistics that came out before COP26, is Norway would have the largest per capita emissions in the world. They only have 5 million people. Their population is comparable to Melbourne, and it's still at the highest in the world. Again, Germany, from the energy vendor and the Bundesneuntig, which is their uh, Green Party, to played periodic roles in the presiding government in, in Germany, and it, it does at the moment, is often seen as a climate leader. Yeah, we can see in Germany there's been very little progress in emissions reductions over the last decade. It's delayed coal and nuclear phase-outs. Like I say, it's literally flattening towns to go after more coal reserves. And in the UK, we are often seen as perhaps the climate leader, as a, uh, I wouldn't say myself, but since the Climate Change Act and the establishment of the Climate Change Committee, which is meant to oversee our progress through fixed carbon budgets every five years, yet even they now argue we, we aren't in touch with, we, we won't meet our fourth and, fifth, fourth and fifth climate budgets in the UK anymore. And actually, again, a bit more like Norway, if you actually factor in the emissions from the city of London, which is an independent part of the UK, it's probably about the size of the campus uh, um, in Melbourne here, that alone would be responsible for 1.8 times the emissions of the entire uh, UK economy together. And then you add the UK back onto that. So in terms of climate leadership, there's been sort of conceptual work done in the literature, again, done by Robin, in which we can sort of differentiate this between front runnership, which is two different ideas of it. You can bring people with you in sort of exemplar, or you can benefit at the expense of. So for example, the inflation reduction act might be an example of this. Their pursuit of electric vehicles is not for the sort of planet per se, it's to decarbonize and have, get a comparative advantage in America, first and foremost, before anything else. 
And there's also a different understanding of climate leadership, which is substantive leadership, which we'll talk about in a second. But beyond that, there's a sort of like neo-positivist trend from scholars and, and climate organisations who like to essentially have some indices or criteria in which we can determine who are the goodies and who are the baddies. But some of the problems that me and, me and Will are trying to sort of examine with this article is this process, and it's not without value, we're not, we're not saying that, there is some value in this, does set a binary. So you either are a leader or you are a laggard, whereas intuitively it seems like some countries could probably be in between. It doesn't seem logical that you have to be one or the other. And also within that, it also sets up this sort of historical fixed attribution in which once you are defined as one or the other, it seems very, very difficult for any country, no matter what they do, to sort of shape that tag. And there are some examples. So Miranda Shrews, for example, questioned whether Germany was a climate leader, but it still sort of persists with those ideas. And some people have questioned whether the UK is, but we're still seen as a climate leader. So the sort of broad illustration of this, this is this very year's CCPI index in which they basically tried to say who are the climate leaders and like odds. And as you can see, the UK here is number 20 in, in the yellow, which probably would not suggest we are a climate leader. But on the flip side of that, India is number seven. And this, this uh, flame here means we have an incumbent fossil fuel industry. So again, this isn't without value, but it's basically saying that India, who have one of the, the latest net zero objectives on the planet, and we're instrumental in uh, the fossil fuel phase out being, being changed into phase down, apparently the seventh best country in the world. And on the flip side of that, you can see Australia's here at number 50, which has gone up five places, which means you aren't the, the laggard anymore. Um, but this would suggest that this red part is actually the climate laggards are. And there is actually a probably more middle ground in which none of these countries are either inherently good nor bad. So that leads us to essentially the question we're trying to under the talk and the article we're writing, which is what, if anything, has the Climate Change Act changed? Uh, and is Australia still a climate laggard? And what we're trying to sort of entertain within the article is there's a, there's sort of a temporal understanding of climate leadership and laggardship in which you can just, once we know what one country is because we've done all the prior work, for example, Australia in this case, can we just judge the changes that have happened in Australia without necessarily, or at least initially, judging it against other countries? So if it was a climate laggard because of X, if Y has changed, can we revisit these notions of laggard and leadership? And then we can probably go into more of the relational understanding in which we can always judge it against another country. Well, but what we're not saying in this article, and I can see more of the Aussies probably grimace at the idea that Australia could even be a climate leader, is we're not saying they are a leader. We're basically trying to question the idea, are they actually still the laggard they've often been perceived to be? So, well, some theory. You want to give people some theory? So, quick rundown here um, of conceiving leadership and laggardship. So, essentially, most of the literature on this does disproportionately focus on leadership itself, and we're trying to kind of shift the focus to what is laggard and the importance of laggardship in general for the wider climate regime. Now, we're flipping-ish the substantive leadership idea from, again, yours really, Robin Eckersley, um, which talks about not the front-runnership idea, which is kind of doing it alone for comparative advantage or other, uh, other political or economic reasons, but the idea of attracting followership, the laggards themselves. So the three core components of this are the asymmetrical influence of leaders on directing and setting the behaviour of other states, the followers, um, so here, our focus is on the laggards being subjected to this influence and, more importantly, becoming, in effect, a policy or ambition taker. Uh, moving on to the commitment to a common purpose. Basically, there has to be a shared goal that, you know, this is the direction we're heading. There's not overly ambitious states that are going it alone where they are so overly ambitious that they exceed rather than lead. You know what I mean by that? They're going too far that no one's actually going to follow them. And then thirdly, the consent to follow. So basically the idea that this is something worthwhile doing and it's an absence of defection. You just have to consent enough to do it that you actually follow. So that's the focus we're here. We're not saying Australia is a climate leader, but rather, yeah, some aspects of Australian society have controlled and consented to an idea that maybe we, we are a laggard and that's not that problematic.
very contestable. We'll get to that point. Um, and of course, we focus on the relational aspect between leadership and legardship, as James mentioned, temporally and rel relationally. And then to do this, we look at the common framework, ideas, interests, and institutions to basically unpack the domestic basis for Australian laggardship. So to sort of test this idea methodologically, uh, we did a multi-method approach, first of which was we looked at an analysis of federal government budgets from 2007, the rationale for starting then was that was when the Labour government isn't now, where the previous government came in and some of the more ambitious policies were designed to 2024, obviously, when the most recent uh, data is available. What we're trying to do with that is essentially look at the content of budgets. So just at the very basic level, how many times is climate change mentioned? And Will didn't seem surprised by the finding, but I was definitely shocked that during what we're going to talk about later in terms of the reduction of climate ambition, it is only mentioned once in climate budgets for about five years, and which is just one footnote in terms of a broader debate about foreign affairs. So which you've seen a more uh, just a skyrocketing of references to climate change, and which you've seen the sort of rhetorical shift from just mitigating against the worst excesses of climate change to now this desire that Australia wants to be a clean energy superpower. Um, we also conducted 15 semi-structured interviews with people from all levels, uh, political levels of Australian government, so the federal, state and city level, research organisations and NGOs who work on climate in Australia and banks and financial institutions in Australia to see day to day have they actually felt any difference in their work, even an emotive level, since the Climate Change Act? And also, as a sort of feed-in from the broader project we do, we also did a data analysis of Australian climate politics according to the International Energy Agency database for policies that were in force. So not like position papers or things that have since come and gone, but things that are actually in force, and then categorise them by spending by type. So whether that be critical minerals, nuclear, fossil fuels, or whatever it might be. And uh, we found, oh, thank you. So many of us are probably familiar with the term the last decade. Many of us may have lived through it. Um, but basically, a lot of our interviewees referred to this as the period of time between the, from Abbott's inception at the end of 2013 until their defeat, the Morrison government's defeat in 2022. I know that is not an actual decade. I did not label it. Um, so this refers to this kind of, void and dearth of Australian leadership and, of course, in turn, laggardship, which was basically the go-to of Australian politics at the time. Um, things I want to point out here, clearly, as we know, we've had a period of time with prime ministers and deputy prime ministers who are climate sceptical, climate sceptics, um, which is probably the nicest way to frame it. And um, they had a disproportionate influence, of course, um, on the party and the government at that point in time. Under Abbott, at the beginning of the last decade, um, the world-leading policies were dismantled, such as the Clean Energy Futures Act, which is the emissions trading scheme. Um, they reduced funding for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. They, had a deep, they put forward the Ineffective Emissions Reduction Fund and cut the renewable energy target by 20% um, at the beginning, which they tried to do higher, but that had to negotiate down from 40. Um, and a lot of our interviewees spoke to this black hole or void. Um, I think one of our interviews actually called it a depressing period of time, uh, which speaks to the loss of government direction towards any form of federal direction to any pro-climate policies, um, the lack of funding and the flow and effects through industry, organisations and expertise. Some of them actually spoke to a brain drain in Australia, especially in the race to trying to become that renewable energy superpower, trying to bring some of this expertise back into Australia. Um, towards this period, we also were widely condemned on the international um, stage. I feel like it peaked around the Glasgow 2021 COP, um, with Biden in particular calling out Australian laggardship and regional pressures from the Pacific, in particular Pacific Island Forum. And as our star interviewee said, basically this period was a big FU to climate change. Um, so not much happened at the federal level during this period of time. And then going through the interests that occurred, not interests that occurred, the interest dynamic um, during this period of time. So by interest, we're talking about the material costs and benefits and how they shape Australian climate policy making at that point in time, specifically looking at the distributive conflict between carbon and non-carbon intensive actors and their disproportionate representation of interests. <clears throat> 
interests of their interests and preferences. So looking at the Australian case um, and bringing it back to laggard ship, the asymmetrical influence of the embedded fossil capital, fossil fuel regime across both labour and capital, that's the ALP, and um, connected to you know, the CNFEU, the mining unions, that kind of thing, the primary sector unions, and of course capital um, on the flip side of that. What about interviewees said, so that's been a real drag on climate policy. The size of those industries like coal and gas extraction are so much bigger than critical minerals at the moment, which really speaks to this idea that it's not somewhat of a balance of power. There is such an asymmetrical influence, um, which has led to significant representation of their interest in Australian climate policy, which may not be groundbreaking to many in the room. Um, we've seen the, the unambitious policies for quite some time at this point. And one of the ways that they uh, try to sway policymakers, of course, through pol political donations, lobbying efforts, um, the strategic campaigns that emphasize the cost of voters. And as you can see with Julie Bishop at the front there, this speaks to you know, the carbon tax, the mining tax, um, and all those things that have sunk more ambitious climate policy in Australia. And the important thing I want to convey here is that it does occur across both major parties in Australia. And you can just look at the similarities between the gas fight recovery, you know, COVID here, this is how we're going to secure Australia's economic future put forward by the coalition in 2021, and the future gas strategy that was released by the ALP, I think two weeks ago, maybe three, which basically um, formalised a commitment to continued fossil fuel expansion in Australia. Moving now to institutions, and I did enjoy putting that card to Boon in because it does speak to um, the excess of Tony Abbott's impact on the parliament itself, the institutions we're talking about here. So institutional approaches generally focus on how institutions advantage some interests over others um, through their quality, form, access, that kind of thing. Again, the asymmetric influence of carbon intensive sectors. Just wanted to clarify in the Australian case, we are not just looking at fossil fuels, but also more widely the agriculture logging sectors, um, which kind of coalesce around an anti um, climate agenda. And importantly, quote from one of our interviewees, you don't need conspiracy theories. Those companies know exactly how each other work. They know exactly what they've got in common, which I think within this room, it's probably um, widely understood. We know what a large part of the problem is. We know that there's close institutional access between um, the fossil fuel industry and these carbon intensive sectors and government. And yet it hasn't meaning, we haven't found a meaningful way to intervene and actually stop some of this laggard ship, or have we? Dot dot dot. Um, and one of the methods that not methods, one of the approaches that the industry takes is through the revolving door of fossil fuel and government and the elite level access, which was of course peaked during the last decade itself. And doing a deep dive in here, for example, one of the senior advisors to the other government was on also on the board, a member of the board of the Minerals Council. Um, Dick Warburton, who was apparently nicknamed the Renewable Energy Target Slayer. Um, basically, he led a review saying, no, we should lower the Renewable Energy Target. And he had, you know, elite access to Tony Abbott, et cetera, and the Swain government itself. And then also this quote, the quality of climate policy in Australia has mostly followed the electoral cycle from a federal perspective, which again, going back to leadership and laggardship, there was an electoral mandate. There is a legitimacy and consent within Australia through the elections that this government has continued. What I'm essentially trying to say is that, you know, there were three elections during this period. The coalition won each of them and they had an anti-climate agenda the entire time, which is particularly poignant in reference to the 2019 climate election um, where they won again. Um, and this speaks to the last decade under the coalition government, which provided the consent, domestic legitimacy for laggardship itself. Moving now to these lovely ideas and that striking image which comes from the Australian bushfire season 2019 to 2020. By ideas, we're looking at different knowledges, norms, discourses, narratives, and ideologies that shape climate policy making and in turn laggardship. Importantly, we know that we see ideas as both an independent um, influence or factor in climate policy making in Australia, but also, you know, they work to reify and reinforce different Australian interests and institutional access. Um, the Root of All Evil, the Murdoch Media, I'm sure we've all been kind of familiar with them um, and how their role in 
disseminating and propagating a lot of this narr these narratives, such as the anti-renewables. And if you do a deep dive in the Hansard, a lot of these politicians will refer to them as unreliables and kind of emphasize the insecurity that they bring to the Australian economy and our progress and material benefits themselves. The often uh, put forward message, I know Morrison was big on this, taxes over technology for Australia's pathway to decarbonisation, which basically involved nothing. And they also emphasise the transitional risks of climate change and who it's going to impact the most. And these have broadly coalesced and been adopted by a right-wing populist platform that's also you know, occurred in Australia throughout this period. Um, I do want to acknowledge that why, while there has been an asymmetrical influence of these narratives in Australian policymaking. It is not 100% um, to 0%. These pro-climate narratives did always exist in Australia. Importantly, even within the Liberal Party itself, there was some support for emissions trading schemes, especially even prior to Abbott in 2014 and continued throughout. Um, think Malcolm Turnbull, for example. And of course, specific events such as bushfires, um, what else have I got up there? The school strike led by Greta Thunberg um, put an event that coalesced and developed a lot of these narratives in the pro climate ones that we're probably more familiar with. And I mean, eventually led to the emergence of the Teal Movement in the 2022 federal election, which led to an end of the last decade. How long have we got left now? Do we need to breeze through this? Oh, no, you're good. Okay. So that's the bad news. And this is probably a bit more of the good news. So has anything changed in return to the research question of the Climate Change Act? Has there been an uptick in Australia's performance? So at a sort of very initial descriptive level, we can actually see some uptick in performance. So from the 26 to 28% emissions reductions target that existed before, from the 20, 2005 level to 2030, that has since been increased to 43%. There's been a net zero commitment to 2050, which is the most ambitious target in the world, but is comparable to a lot of uh, fellow economies of Australia's size. And there was also a strengthening of the safeguarding mechanism, which one of our interviewees described as a backdoor attempt to reenact an emission trading scheme. And while, they are, while they acknowledge that that doesn't mean it's got the same scope and teeth of the emissions trading scheme, there at least was a sort of tentative attempt to return to the um, policy regime that existed before the last decade. And also there's some, been a return of authority for the Climate Change Authority to monitor the progress or perhaps lack thereof for Australia, which is very similar and akin to the regime we have in the UK with the Climate Change Committee and the Climate Change Act. But beyond the more descriptive aspects, or as we already mentioned, it was, as that graph at the side shows, there was literally no mention of this during the last decade. Climate change was, was just was not on the agenda until the same year. So two budgets were done over the same year in which the coalition government still maintained no reference to climate change. The same year the Labour government comes in, as you can see, there's an absolute skyrocketing of emphasis on climate change. The film saw more descriptive sort of um, political side of the, uh, the debate. Our interviewees said in their sort of day to day, there had been a profound change in Australian climate politics. So as you can see from one of our participants said, the change in governments were going black to white in terms of their stance on climate. And as another one mentioned, the federal government is now far more open to discussions and funding on climate policies, which reflected this broader consensus among all of our interviewees, no matter where they were from, private sector, public sector, that there was far greater access now to MPs, far greater dialogue, far greater collaboration on climate policies, and far greater funding to now actually at least bid for uh, funding for climate change projects and then implement them on the ground. But while we can see sort of a broader um, positive picture, at least the uptick of Australia's climate performance, at least in the, sh in the short term, our interviewees also cited there's now going to be three problems of whether Australia will ever be this leader or clean energy superpower, as they'd like to refer to themselves. And these three problems are almost conditioned by the last decade. So the first one is this idea of policy taking, as one of our um, interviewees referred to it. Basically, what they say is, well, there's been an uptick in, uh, in climate ambition in Australia, and they have essentially reproduced ambition that you can see in climate leaders like the UK. They are just reproducing objectives now that have already preceded them. And that's quite an easy political sell. But actually, to go further than that compared to what everyone's done, that is still going to be politically problematic, which speaks to the sort of temporal relational dynamics of laggard and leadership. That if you're just reproducing what has already been done, do you ever really close the gap on those um, before you from a sort of relational understanding? 
And as one of our interviewees said, there will still be a lag on all of this. So even if there is a broad shift towards a clean energy superpower, that won't immediately be observable in many me many metrics. Though it, this will take a while for Australia to really exhibit an uptick, or it might never actually come to pass. That's also going to be remain to be seen. But the second um, problem Australia is going to face is because they've left it so long in terms of shifting on a lot of these critical minerals, which, as I say, they're more than happy to say that they have a lot of them in Australia and the world leading. But actually, the price for a lot of these goods, and this depends where Australia wants to sit in the value chain of these, but it at least wants to be the extractor of them so it can export them. The price for a lot of these things has already been set now. So there was a talk by someone called Lisa Tilly at SOAS at Manchester recently, and she did a brilliant talk on, on nickel. And she basically said about 10 years ago, there was this huge trade, de trade debate between Indonesia and, it, and Australia. And Australia basically didn't act on this in any way. And now Indonesia set the price of nickel so low that it, it will not make sense for Australia to export this. They, they just can't compete on price anymore. Their labour standards are too, and what labour standards there is, are too high. Uh, and the, the export costs for them to do just will never be comparable to Indonesia. And we can see this across a load of the minerals that they mention in their own reports. So lead, for example, South Korea have already set the price. South Korea, I'm going to want Australia to be a world leader. Uranium has already been set by Kazakhstan. So while they have actual natural reserves, a lot of these things, countries have already acted on this 10 years ago, maybe. And this sort of, these two things basically combined to now Australia's basically left in, an, in sort of a comparative disadvantage now. But while it, in a sort of abstract normative sense, it does, it would it lend itself to quite interesting case. And I think if we want to be really generous to the, um, the governments of the last decade, that while we, whilst environmental scholars and economic scholars and macrofinancial scholars talk about first mover advantage, there's also an idea of a second mover advantage. And if you read the work of uh, Robert Schwarzman, who works at the Banque de France, and Brett Christopher talks about this idea, that about 10 years ago, there was an argument to say that investing in these infrastructures was illogical. If you want to guarantee economic returns 10 years ago, there was no point investing in, the, in this infrastructure. It was inherently capital intensive. There was no guarantee of return, even, even, even if you could get a return. And you're investing in, in technologies you never knew would come to pass. So while we obviously focus on things like electric cars now, there's been many technologies that have come and gone that people invested in. And actually, if you read Brett, Brett, Brett Christopher's work now, he would still argue that if you wanted to make just, uh, an investment as an investor and you take away the normative principle of climate change, you would you still make more money investing in fossil fuels than you do from um, a climate climate friendly infrastructure. And that is still the case. And obviously, the broader shift now is even though the, the, the policy and price taking Australia, we now exist in a in a um, political landscape, as we mentioned at the start, in which loads of countries are moving on this now. So China, through the 2025 strategy, is already moving on this, and they're moving at a scale and a scope, I don't think, is going to be comparable to any liberal economy. America are moving up on this. They've sort of got a profound undertaking through the Inflation Reduction Act, and the European Union are now moving on this through the European Green Deal. And then they've moved before, and they can move at a scale and scope I don't think Australia will be able to compete with. So while there's an uptick in climate ambition, whether these things will actually come to pass in Australia is probably quite uh, doubtful at best. So we'll, we'll end on this. Are, is Australia a, a leader of climate policy? No. But is it still the laggard it was often associated to be? We'd probably argue also no. But we also want your opinions on this idea that we came up with, which was more of a brain fart than something that was sort of... <laughs> academically constructed to be philosophically profound, this idea of a leg art. What do you all think of that? Idiotic or catchy? I'll let you decide. And we've got some quotes there by participants who I think aptly sum up the problem, what is going on in Australia, which I'll leave to digest at your leisure. So thanks so much for your time. And we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you both. That was very, um, very insightful, I'd say. Oh, it's got some more people in the room. Um, so let's take some questions. I'm going to just bring up the Zoom and see if we have any questions there. But if there's anyone in the room that wants to start us off. Um, yeah. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at SSPS, but I also work in financial media in the UK. So great talk, firstly. So my question obviously relates to, in terms of the one of the actors you might Imagine plays a role in climate ambition. 
is the what, what you might call long-term patient capital. And I think if you look at Australia and then compare it to the UK, you have these asset owners, the large asset owners, so super funds in Australia, LGPS in the UK. There's been this transformation of their interests with regard to climate finance over the past, let's say, five to 10 years, particularly because the definition, legal definition of fiduciary responsibility, that's changed. They themselves now have portfolio emissions reductions targets, and they also have transformed the way they, let's say, communicate with top-level political leadership. So in Australia, you have ACSI, ACC, ACCR, you have IGCC. In the UK, I think you have a lot of political dialogue between these a lot of asset owners and policymakers. So I'm curious, in terms of determining who's a laggard and who's not, what is the role of the structure of long-term patient capital? Is that, is that a factor of interest? Or? I mean, it's really speaking to the distributive conflict, right, and the balance of power. And, like, yes, I agree, like, it is a growing, like, the balance is slightly over time getting closer um, vis-a-vis, like, carbon-intensive sectors. I don't think we're particularly there yet, and I don't think the end of the last decade has signaled a massive shift structurally in the Australian economy. I suppose with the idea of um, financial trends, which, you know, on the one hand, is a Someone who's looked at it can obviously fill you with quite a bit of hope sometimes, but then you sometimes you can look at the figures and the inordinate amounts that are still spent on uh, fossil capital still are orders of magnitude greater than a lot of these things. So this, which is I think where you're speaking to the sort of broader idea of will sort of our ethical investors in, invest in this um, irrespective of the sort of immediate returns that a lot of investors would want. And that obviously sort of feeds into the sort of idea which... I think you probably heard of Jens van der Kloos, did Danielle Gabor, they talk about this idea that even, even with the sort of broader uptick, a lot of these requirements are still voluntary. They're by no means binding. And if you look at sort of um, financial taxonomies that are trying to sort of crowd capital into these things, what they would consider green is dubious at best still. Um, and obviously this is still continues to find, if you read obviously like Danielle Gabor's work to a certain extent, it still continues to find an active role of the state to crowd in or de-risk some of this capital finance. You obviously need to some form of investment within the state to then crowd in private capital, whether it be patients or whatever it might be, um, which Australia is doing, but as we already mentioned, there's now going to be a compete for that capital. There is only a finite amount of it. Obviously, we can produce more with sort of theories of money, but at least from what the, the capital supply we have now, this will be competed on. While it might go to some of the industries, one, I don't think it'll go to Australia, and two, whether it be is the sort of requirement we need to um, meet net zero objectives. I, I unfortunately would still be very doubtful about that as well. Yeah. Terrific paper. Really, really important stuff too. So thank you very much for it. Um, I just want to sort of tease out a couple of things which I'm a little puzzled by in terms of how you've put it together. And in, in a sense, rather cheaply in reference to a, a very old chapter that Robert and I did, the uh, Dreisek and, and Schlossberg anthology, which was doing comparative work, again, broadly speaking about leaders and maggots. Um, a couple of things struck me about the way in which you're going about this, which I think probably much more thoroughly systematised than the actual paper itself. But it seemed to me that a great deal depends on how you frame the problem you're dealing with and how you, what sort of indicators you use for performance, for leadership and leadership. The thing that seemed to me to be the case in this paper was that you're relying very strongly on ideational leadership, mm. or what I call promissory notes. Policies and actual implementation offer you very, very different things. Legislation and what comes to bear, very different things indeed. So there's a strong emphasis on ideational leadership, which I think is very important and very important in the international context. But how weighted, how you are going to weight that in your assessment of leadership, leadership, I think is a question. In terms of actual performance, again, there are a whole range of different areas to which one can look. Emissions being probably the most important, uptake of, of renewables, investment and so on, and you're onto that. But there is that question of relational um, stresses and weighting between those different types of indicators. Mm -hmm. So it'd be really interesting to see how the paper develops those and uses them comparatively. The other thing I want to stress is, is, as, as a puzzle, I suppose, is the framing issue. And I think we talked about this briefly yesterday, the framing issue of, of the temporality of the problem. If you look at, firstly, 
the actual problem itself. There are no leaders. There are only relative laggards. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at what really has to be done in emissions reduction, I think it's very important to recognise that leadership is a, a very problematic term in relation to the actual goal and performance of the requirement. Um, but having said that, the, the, the temporal framing of the paper is also very important. I think it's, while well, the lost decade, I don't like the term myself, I think it's useful, but if you put the Australian political, the policy developments into their proper context, you'd have to include the Howard government and the context setting, or the, 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 the decades of wrecking that were achieved, then, which then enabled the lost decade to come into being in the way in which it did. So it's the second comment, frame, temporal framing comment. The last comment I want to make, and again, I'm stressing this is a very good paper, and it's a very pro provocative paper. Um, think about this, see how long it is. Um, again, it's this problem of different political systems. Mm. And in the Australian context, um, it's, I think, important to recognise that while there is significant laggardship and very poor performance at the federal level, at the sub-national level, in fact, a great many things were occurring which ran against that trend. How you incorporate that into this sort of very complex narrative, I think, is a really interesting puzzle. There are obviously differences between unitary states like Britain and Norway and much more complex states, federal states like Germany and Australia. And I think it's important to bring that out. Having said all of that, I think that the, you know, the puzzle of what is a lead and what is a lag is a very important one. The rhetorical political usage of the terms is very important as well. I think it's, it's they, they are very, very useful terms, and I think that that's one of the reasons why this paper is as important as it is. Where to begin? Um, thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, the last point on the ambition that Australia and the leadership that Australia has shown at the sub-state level is very important. It is something we do talk about in our paper, maybe at this point quite cursively, um, cause, yeah, not much. Um, so we'll definitely try to bring that in, um, which I guess complicate. We are looking at the federal level predominantly, but of course, what is federal if not a group of sub-states actors? So I don't really have a satisfying answer to that. I'm not gonna lie. Um, we've thought about it, haven't, this is a work in progress, which is apparently the first thing I forgot to say in the talk. This is a paper in progress. So yeah, but basically we'll bring that in. Yeah. That was part of the plan. Well, you could exclude it. I mean, it's one of those things. We'll acknowledge it. Yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, I think we'll have to do the similar thing with the context of the Howard government and like the preconditions you're kind of alluding to for the last decade. Um, yeah, we kind of... So look at point at good things that happened in the Rod Gillard era and don't go further back than that. Um, purely for how much we how much space we have in the paper itself. Um, but I think we'll try to do a shorthand. Dot dot dot, this has happened. Um, we were thinking of doing a visual timeline of Australian climate policy, like the the big, big moments. Maybe we'll go further back and draw it out a little bit in the paper. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose what, um, just to sort of finish on that, I'd agree with you, Peter, that um, such as my sort of critical disposition on a lot of these things, I would say there was no leaders on most things. We're all crap. Um, <laughs> some of us are just less <laughs> crap than others. But yeah. amidst all the wades of crap that we've since done, environmental scholars nonetheless want to persist with some sort of stratification. So if we take that sort of sort of trend when they let you on its own terms, I think what we're trying to do. So I think there's quite a lot of what you said in there in terms of the utility, there is a utility of this, but it's not the defining picture. And there's a lot of nuances and gray areas that exist within this sort of idea. We're just going to sort of take it on its own terms and question whether this actual aspect of it is still empirically holds true. So hopefully the, the actual write-up of it will have a lot of those elements you mentioned, um, but it's definitely something we need to, um, to cooperate. Let's draw out one other thing in relation to, again, the framing. A great deal of emphasis on domestic politics leads to one picture. Yeah. And you, you did bring in the international dimension, and it is very important. If you include the international dimension, that's something to look at. In the Australian case, the massive emphasis on exporting fossil fuels completely changes one's perspective on how Australia is performing. Mm -hmm. So you, you bring that up with Norway, for example. Um, those sorts of issues, I think, are very important in terms of determining how one assesses yeah. the relationship. Yeah. Like yeah. 
So we have Robin and then one up the back. So we have Robin first. Yeah, I've got a large bunch of stuff, which we'll talk about later, but I just want to raise a couple of conceptual points. There's another term in the literature here, which I think would be really useful for you, and that's spoiler. Spoiler is a party to the Paris Agreement that's actively undermining the basic object of the treaty. And of course, the OPEC states have been, um, they've got the gong for that pretty much year in, year out, and they appear on the bottom of the ladder. But you could say that Australia um, has, has been a bit of a saboteur or a spoiler at different points. Uh, and even, even the Labor government's decision now to go with the gas strategy is actively undermining. So I think that's great. And I love the way you presented those three countries as both leaders and laggards and rejected the binary. I think that's fantastic. And I think problematizing it is a really important part of this paper. And obviously, if you break it down, it depends on which aspect, and you'll get a bunch of things. And how to weight that and put it together is mind-numbingly difficult because they're incommensurable. And all these lead laggers like the Climate Change Performance Index do that in ways that you think. It's just, they just come up with weightings and we kind of just go with it. But um, it's like trying to bundle together what makes us happy or what gives us a quality of life. It's kind of faintly ludicrous at one level. So if you sort of just focus on some areas and not others, you either refuse to play the game or put them together and just show your methodology transparently. That's the best you can do. But I think spoiler is quite important there. And that's only when you're talking about leadership as performance relative to a metric. And that includes an understanding of the goals and what you're doing in relation to those goals because they're shared goals if you're a party to the Paris Agreement. So you can take everyone on their word. They're a party. You assume they accept these goals, but they're actively being a spoiler in some instances, but not all. And that, that's the kind of contradiction um, that we see in the Australian Labor Party at the moment. And, and, and it's really important the way you look at relative to past performance at a particular point in time. But because all parties are supposed to be ratcheting up, everyone's supposed to be doing that. We're doing it more slowly than others. That keeps us in the close to the laggardship end of the performance um, understanding of leadership. But if, if you understand political leadership is building, is building understanding about a shared goal and um, succeeding in attracting followers and working towards that, you know, how much Australia is doing that domestically, politically, vis-a-vis -vis the electorate, vis-a-vis -vis stakeholders and so forth. That's a qualitative judgment that you would have to make. And they're clearly trying to do it in the economic space, but um, the contradictions abound. But anyway, I think spoiler is something you've got to put in there as well. And that would take us back to the Howard government. So it's more than a decade. Yeah. It's very long. I was going out. Yeah, yeah. Underlined. I've got it. <laughs> but as a Marxist, I just think like capitalism has contradictions. Who would have thought? <laughs> Only someone said that in the 18th. <laughs> Another. Yes, it was. Although it is really just a minor point. I think this is fascinating work. I'm an epidemiologist and work in climate change and health. But just one of the points I sort of thought about when I was listening to this was almost like a case study focus, taking one of the urban systems like transport um, and exploring the nuances of that within the Australian context, because it would be fascinating to do that given current changes in legislation. Um, where, we're, where we are as motor cities in Australia um, and what we support in terms of fossil fuels. So uh, I guess it would just be, there would be some nuances there that might be good to illustrate the points around where we are in terms of leadership, if at all, um, and how, we're, how that's playing out in current legislation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fascinating area of the transport system in terms of understanding how we might mitigate if we have the opportunity. Great, thank you. Um, we had a similar thing when we thought about Australian leadership potentially in like the solar industry and the up residential uptake in Queensland in particular. Like it, going back to the point about the metrics that we use for leadership and laggardship, um, we are trying, I think, to do a bit more of a holistic approach, but we could nuance, I think, address it basically, the different things happening, yeah. um, which goes to the substate point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's a good point. About, uh, I think me and Peter spoke is in terms of like solar industry, if you look at that, for example, Australia there would be reason to say maybe is a, a climate leader. But obviously, for anyone that does academic publishing, there's a stark difference between the philosophical endeavor of trying to research this and then trying to consolidate it down to 8,000 words for a uh, research article. So maybe we'll put it in the conclusion that everyone should do this. And then one of you guys will <laughs> follow up on it. Um, I saw Kate's got a yeah. question. Um, 
I've just a comment from myself. I've been sitting with this legard term for the last ten minutes. Tell us then. It is not. It's not working for me. <laughs> That's just me. Maybe. Maybe I liked uh, Robin's lead lead legard. I think that kind of. Put it to a vote yeah, there, and you get a poll. Yeah, at the end, we're going to put it to a vote. So I want you to sit with it. It just doesn't, it doesn't roll for me. But um, okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, yeah, I I agree. I don't. I'm not sure about the legard term. I've also been thinking about it. No. I'm going to do an impact thing, and I've got word in the dictionary. Um, no, I have some thoughts so that might take you beyond um, leader laggard, No, no. So, and really building on what Peter said, I think that was really helpful, particularly the um, different aspects of leadership. And so, and it's really striking. It's a great presentation, great paper. Really striking graph you had about the mention of climate change in the budgets. And that was just so like night and day between the two different um, governments, between the two major parties. So there's something going on there, obviously, and that you can speak to leadership in terms of that, but it is ideational leadership. And then you seems to evaluate the, the impact or implementation in terms of the clean energy superpower and um, scaling up renewables. And this obviously there's a lot more of that coming from the Labor government. Australia's really trying to get on the front foot there. Maybe they'll not catch up with the, um, the European Green Deal and the IRA and things like that. But I think it's there's... Um, it's still not getting at the heart of addressing climate change, which really is in terms of emissions. So you can be a clean energy superpower and a major fossil fuel exporter at the same time, which is where Australia is going. Yeah. And so I think there needs to be a little bit of drilling down into that. And what's been interesting for me watching this shift to the Labor government is um, so there's been a lot more climate policies and funding the climate policy and all this investment in, in renewables and a lot of good rhetoric and some good policies, but there has been nothing to actually tackle the um, coal and gas industry and to reduce emissions. And when you start to look at the policies that are supposed to do that, like the safeguard mechanism reform and the review of the ACU scheme, they're incredibly disappointing and they're about going absolutely nowhere, like con continuing the same thing we had under the coalition government. And so what's interesting for me is why is Australia so stuck here? Why, despite a clear ideational difference between the parties, can we not move on the policies that really matter? And I think, well, uh, I think Robin probably yeah. has the answer, but um, well, I think it would be interesting to bring that in. And so when you're evaluating are they a leader, and I think the spoiler thing comes in here as well. So Australia is no longer a spoiler, perhaps. Um, I would say certainly in the international context under Labor, they're trying to not be a spoiler. But that doesn't make them um, not a laggard either. If I could just jump in there. I think getting back to the three eyes, Will, um, there's more you can do to flesh out institutions because there's political institutions and there's economic institutions. I mean, some people say our economy is a housing market with an economy attached to it. I say it's a mining industry with a small economy attached to that. Yeah. And the government's going down a path that's just continuing to build our mining industry. I mean, it is trying to do a bit of green manufacturing down, down the way, but it's, it's the next step in processing, right? It's, because we can't compete with the labour costs in factory Asia. It's just not possible. So it's tricky for us. So our mining industry is the mainstay of our economy. And so there's, um, you can talk about the cosy relationships and the revolving door between the Minister of Resources and the Minerals Council of Australia, but that's more about agency. It's the structural nature of that and it's it, the crucial role it plays in the budget, you know, in terms of if, if a country wants to be a leader, it has to have the political and economic capacity and the fiscal power to do that. And the mining industries help to bail us out of, a bigger hole that we'd otherwise be in. We actually posted a surplus last year and this year, but thereafter it's going to be a deficit. So these are structural problems that any government has to ban manage. And you know Bailey's work about the trilemma of the green state. So that's that's a trilemma. The other one I think is really important is the nature of political parties are institutions and the nature of our party competition, which is shaped by our electoral system and the political geography of electorates, is absolutely fundamental in understanding Australian um, climate policy, climate energy policy. So, you know, Queensland, <laughs> um, the Liberal National Party in Queensland plays an outsized role in the coalition, and they're the tail that has wagged the dog of the coalition's climate policy for so long. It's not to say WA and other, I was about to say countries, WA is another country, but <laughs> the political competition between the parties is that they've cancelled out um, 
a thing about fossil fuels. You know, they just kind of are in two, uh, the base basically in one mind as to the importance of the mining industry in this country. And that's just not going to change. It's baked in. And the political geography of electorates doubles that up. And that helps to give what Milden Berger calls the double representation. But it's also, here you have the parties that uh, represent capital and labour and environment, consumer interests are left to the Greens and the Teals. And they, the nature of our electoral system does not give them a proportionate representation relative to population because of the political geography of electorates. And that's a political institutional factor. So they're pretty baked in and they're pretty fundamental. And they're not going to change anytime soon. I suppose the three I frame, which is sort of build on what you said there, what you both said there, in terms of there's sort of an interrelationship there, which it's going to take a bit of sophisticated to uh, wielding together, I think, in the analysis. But a lot of it is contingent, but at least what I see is what you, the idea of climate policy, the idea of the impact of climate changes in physical risk, and the idea of what climate policy is meant to serve. And obviously, if you read Mark Blythe's work in terms of the sort of power of ideas before you can even then dictate what happens at the political and economic level is you basically it doesn't have to be rational so a lot of these contradictions with i think we both raised and sort of teasing out that yes something is being done but it's nowhere near the scale of the challenge obviously mark would argue it doesn't have to it doesn't even have to be logical ideas that dictate the action we're doing it doesn't even have to you can even deny climate change is existing and that can then determine policy um, dimensions and i uh, did have something else to say but since forgot while talking yeah, great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> going back to the point, like the, the double track, kind of like double barrel Australian approach is, you know, we'll build this industry without stopping that industry. Um, it's definitely something we've discussed and like thought about. I do think connecting it to the ideas of different forms of political leadership would be quite instrumental to our paper. So thank you for that point. Um, and the political institutions, yes, I actually had, I think, a dot point on the adversarial political system in Australia, but I was like, nah, for time, I'll remove. So we are somewhat thinking of um, institutions in that way as well. Um, so just really developing that in the paper. Thanks. Good points. Um, I'm, can I, I'm going to use my moderator powers to jump in and ask a question myself, mm -hmm. which is kind of related to the question that Kate and Robin um, brought up then, which is this idea of, like, the kind of leadership that we're talking about now, to me, seems like it's pointing towards a leadership in green industries rather than a leadership in climate change. Um, and, you know, we spoke about the fact that uh, these climate policies are really industrial policies with climate tacked onto them. If you, in the West, if you go a step further than that, they're China response policies through industrial policy, through climate policy. Um, so, one question I, I sort of had, which obviously is outside the scope of your paper, is would these policies be addressing climate at all if the Made in China 2025 policy hadn't targeted green industries as a strategic area that China needed to be at the forefront of? And second to that, given that these economies that you're talking about, Australia and in, in Europe as well as the case, are very capital heavy and reliant on finance and capital, there's a need for a signal to the market that these are the industries we want you to invest in. And the extent to which the idea of being a climate leader is related to we are somewhere where you can come and have a kind of a long-term interest in invest, investing in our green industries because we are this kind of climate pro-climate place where we're going to support these industries for the long term. We have these visions of being a renewable energy superpower. Um, to what extent the idea of a climate being a climate leader is kind of being bastardized almost to be like we're somewhere where you can invest in green industries. Yeah. Well, I suppose one of the so um, Jojo and M Singh, who's done a lot of research on how this is developing in in Asia, which is part of the China strategy. And to be fair to China, they did say they were going to move on this. Maybe the climate didn't play a rationale, but they did purposely pick these technologies to move in that. And I think this again depends on where you want to sit in the value chain of all of this. I'm always reminded when we talk about this in terms of um, what one of my interviewees coming for a PhD is: don't let the enemy be the be the, the enemy of the. What is the saying? Don't let the don't perfect be the, the enemy of the good. good. That's it. And it, it, it was basically saying because I asked you, I asked Jojo after his after his, after his talk, in which he said all of these countries are moving now, and he actually didn't mention climate change in any of his talk, but he said all these industries are developing. You know, 
dealt in all over Asia to essentially lent itself to a very sort of typical Ricardian understanding of comparative advantage. But I suppose for us as climate scholars, it's if it happens, do we really need to care that much? If, if that's the if that's the way for policymakers to understand it in a rationale, they need which goes back to that the sort of subjective ideas. So I suppose with the sort of very short time frame we've got to actually meet these, if we're ever going to meet them at all by 2050, if that's the only way we're going to do it, well, you, you, you could argue as a sort of bastardization of climate policy. I don't personally have too much of a, a problem with it. But China definitely, because they had a sort of aggregate reduction of exports in fossil fuel industries, did shift to this toward purposely. And I suppose why you, the, the inevitable question is why are they moving on these things? There is a broader depoliticization of fossil fuels and legitimization of these things. So I don't think the environment climate rational has to be taken out of it. I think states are responding to the sort of international uh, landscape of that. We'll take one more question from the room and then I think we'll need to wrap up if anyone's got one last burning question. No, and we haven't got any online, so we'll... Ah, one, one more question. <laughs> this is more of a relatively basic question, but it's something I've been thinking of. Um, and the question I had was, what are the potential implications of the retreat of globalization or neoliberalism and the rise of what's been termed a, a relatively bipartisan neo-populism? Uh, how could impact policy density, uh, retrenchment or, or uh, expansion, uh, an embracement, the embracing of competing industrial policy, particularly in the United States with uh, in relation to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act? Um, and how well, how that it lead, how that impacts your assessment of climate leadership, whether that it's oh, if you get what I mean. Mm. So, in terms of the sort of idea of um, yes, yeah, so as as I mentioned in the talk, we can see a sort of right wing populism against the sort of idea that we should do something about climate change. But obviously, one of the sort of Typical examples of this is Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. You could get it through as long as you take the climate bit out and just call it the Inflation Reduction Act, even though sort of orthodox fiscal theory would say it's, it's actually going to increase inflation, you know, which is one of the peculiarities of it. But again, that goes back to the point in terms of if you can couch as a comparative advantage and just still get the climate thing through and maybe almost depoliticize the sort of climate change aspect of it, which I think is a strategy, particularly Joe Biden wants to do if I think we're given a generous uh, understanding of it. Like I say, I think that probably will give a sort of sense of leadership in, in that sense. But I, I sort of, one of the things I think we're trying to say in the article is these things still need to be interrogated. It's sort of a graduate, graduate, an aggregate rather emissions reductions profile only tells you so much about these things. And just focusing on what one sort of simple metric can actually belie quite a lot of details of why you do these things, how these things were made possible. Um, and as you can say, you can strip the climate out, which I think goes back to Theo's idea of the bastardization of climate policy. But again, it goes back to the idea, if we do it, if, if we get to the sunny uplands, whether it be in Australia or UK or whatever, by 2050, should we ever, should we care how we got there, really, as long as just make sure we do? So I always, well, I'm a very critical person, I think we're probably, we've balls it up already. But the thing I hold on to in terms of hope is maybe these things can actually uh, ensure we don't uh, perish. Honestly, great job. This is a resounding endorsement of nuclear war. <laughs> Thanks for the room for important feedback and yeah. uh, nice questions. Thank you very much. Round of applause. <laughs>